профессионального историка и для... They are espionage's master eavesdroppers. They command computers which can break virtually any code. Their specialized spycraft has shaped the course of history. Yet many Americans are unaware this agency exists. In World War II, their expertise enabled pilots to slay Japan's most valuable officer. In the Cold War, secret messages they intercepted exposed a massive Russian spy ring in the United States. In the future, they'll be America's defense against a predicted electronic Pearl Harbor. They are America's code makers and code breakers. Today, they conduct their secret war at the NSA, the National Security Agency. For the first time, this fortress has opened its doors to documentary cameras. The agency, whose mission is to tap any signal of danger from the most remote site on Earth and deliver it to the president within 10 minutes. An insider's look at the top secret NSA. Inside this deceptively ordinary building in Fort Meade, Maryland, is a top secret intelligence organization unrecognized by most passers by. It's encased in copper meshing to shield its clandestine work from electronic eavesdroppers. For more than 45 years, the NSA has maintained a level of secrecy so absolute, its employees joke that its initials stand for no such agency. With a budget that exceeds the CIA's, the NSA is America's most costly intelligence service. Though the figures are classified, it's estimated its annual operating cost is $8 billion. That's 8,000 million pounds. But espionage experts maintain the secret work performed here is worth every penny. The NSA's employees are the masters in a specialized branch of spying, communications intelligence. 24 hours a day, the NSA is listening. It drinks in an ocean of foreign communications from a worldwide network of eavesdropping stations. Phone calls and faxes of foreign drug barons, radio signals between international terrorists, electronic fingerprints of tanks and missiles at military flashpoints. While the accuracy and depth of intelligence gathered by conventional human spies can be severely limited, communications intelligence can provide the full inside story. Basically, the best source of intelligence that you have is signals intelligence. It's far better than spies. With a spy, you never know whether he's not sending information to set you up someday for some kind of a deception. With signals intelligence, you're getting the absolute information from the horse's mouth. You're sticking your head into the other guy's huddle. You're hearing his exact words, what he's saying, what he's thinking. It is possible, of course, to send false messages to deceive any eavesdroppers. But such deception is rarely implemented because it can also confuse the intended receiver. The common approach is to send genuine messages but protect them with complex codes. It is these encoded messages which comprise a huge proportion of the messages the NSA intercepts. To break these codes, the NSA has assembled the world's greatest brains trust of cryptologists. These cryptologists have unlocked the most closely protected secrets of America's adversaries. Then if I wanted to encipher the message... Grooming new cryptologic talent is one of the NSA's highest priorities. Before cryptologists can learn how to break codes, they must understand how to make them. 
One of the first steps is learning how to use multiple alphabets to encode a message. This is what we call polyalphabetic substitution. I'm going to add in four more alphabets to make a grand total of five cipher alphabets. Now we have five different cipher alphabets with which to work. Now let's go back to our original message and try to encipher attack at dawn. The first letter, the A in the attack, the first A in it, we're going to use the very first alphabet. So this is our uh, plain text here. We're going to make cipher text. Find the A in the plain text and use the first alphabet. It corresponds to the letter P, just as it did before. Now go to the second plain text character, the T, but this time bump down to the second cipher alphabet. So we find our T, and it corresponds this time to an F. So we write F is, is, is our cipher character. Advance to the third alphabet now. T is again the plain text. Find your plain text T in the third alphabet. This time it's an I. So here we have two T's, but this time we have two separate uh, and distinct cipher characters corresponding to those T's. This is what makes the polyalphabetic substitution that much more difficult to break. Only the most gifted minds will become NSA code breakers, but sheer intellectual prowess is just the first criterion. There needs to be a certain technical competence in mathematics and probably language, but what they really need is uh, the curiosity of a detective and the persistence of a pit bull. And it really helps too if they're really creative. The tenacity and self-confidence of NSA cryptologists is coupled with a curious indifference toward the content of the messages they unravel. An interesting phenomenon about uh, many code breakers is that they don't really care about the message they're trying to read. What they're interested in, chiefly, is breaking the code, beating the code breaker, dis conquering the other guy. So once they have solved the code, they kind of lose all interest in it. Once the code has been cracked, decrypted messages with volatile content are instantly relayed to the nerve center of the NSA, the National Security Operations Center, NSOC. Here, NSA officials manage crisis situations codenamed Critic. The NSA averages a critic every three days. With a staff on alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they monitor a global network of listening posts. This is a training exercise, but actual critic situations include threats to U.S. military forces, planned or actual attacks on the president or other U.S. officials, and incidents that may heighten tension along international borders. Hey, phone call from LaSalle at 1401 Zulu. The pilot has been recovered. Cease all CSAR activity and stand down. In crisis or calm, the NSA depends not only on its superior pool of cryptologic talent, but also the finest technology, state-of-the-art supercomputers, cyber spies which have revolutionized the art of espionage. In a specially designed building at NSA headquarters is the greatest concentration of supercomputers on Earth. While the supercomputers themselves occupy the second level of the two-story facility, the first floor contains the massive cooling system required to keep them running. It has a capacity for 8,000 tons of water. The chilled water is used to cool a substance called fluorinert, a non-conductive liquid in which the computer's heat-generating circuitry is immersed. The NSA's cryptologists depend on the immense power and speed of these computers to help them make and break codes. One of the most powerful of the agency's supercomputers is known as the thinking machine. In attempting to break a code, it will mount a brute force attack, trying every possible combination to determine the code's key. 
Such a task is formidable, as the possible keys for a common encryption system total 70 quadrillion, that's 70,000 billion. It would take a home computer 22,000 years. The thinking machine can do it in just a few seconds. The NSA's supercomputers are the product of a long heritage of cryptologic technology. This is the thinking machine's ancient ancestor, an electromechanical calculator codenamed the BOM. Designed in 1940, 12 years before the NSA was created, it stood 2.5 meters tall and weighed 5 tons. Though it lacked the capacity of today's home computers, for its time it was a marvel, the fastest computing device ever made. It and America's top cryptologists of that era were under the command of specialized branches of the Army and Navy. Though their expertise was unquestioned, their effectiveness was undermined by the absence of one unified agency for communications intelligence, and this resulted in catastrophe. Several hours before bombs fell at Pearl Harbor, American codebreakers suspected that a surprise attack was imminent. But no efficient system of disseminating communications intelligence yet existed, and Hawaii received its warning 60 minutes too late. Despite the disaster at Pearl Harbor, the cryptologists would play a pivotal role in World War II. Their feats would pave the way for the formation of the NSA following the war. Key to the Allies' strategy was cracking Nazi Germany's secret code, generated by the German cipher machine, which was called the Enigma. The Enigma instantaneously encrypted typed plain text messages one letter at a time. As each letter was typed, electrical impulses sent it through a series of plugs and rotors until it appeared in its new enciphered form. It was then written down for radio transmission. A vast number of possible rotor settings allowed each message to be enciphered according to its own unique and presumably unbreakable code. The um, possible permutations on the machine per letter are 2 to the uh, 280th power. The Germans had no reason to fear that the Allies would uh, uh, invent anything or develop anything that would be sufficient to, to make that number of permutations uh, solvable. Fortunately for us, they were wrong. The Allies' answer to Enigma was the bomb conceptualized by the Poles, designed by the British, and built by the Americans. It was able to rapidly test all possible rotor settings and determine the key for each individual message. Early in the war, German U-boats ruled the Atlantic, so the cryptologists targeted radio signals encrypted by Enigma, which contained the submarine's locations. These signals would be intercepted by a worldwide network of listening posts. The intercepted signals were then transcribed and rushed to Washington, where cryptanalysts fed the data into one of 120 bombs for deciphering. The deciphered information pinpointing the U-boat's locations would then be forwarded to Navy destroyers patrolling the Atlantic. A staggering 782 German submarines were destroyed by Allied naval units. These were armed with Enigma intercepts decoded by the bomb. I think its contributions to the war in the Atlantic against the submarines uh, was absolutely essential to winning the war. If we had not uh, ended the German submarine threat, the United States would never have been able to send enough men and materiel to Europe to, to fight the Germans. 
Throughout World War II, crucial Allied victories would hinge on the secret contribution of cryptologists. In the war against Japan, their challenge was to break a complex numeric code known as JN25. Unlike Enigma, JN25 would be broken not by technology, but by sheer brain power. The work against the Enigma was largely machine-based. The work against JN25, which was a paper and pencil code, required a sweat of the brow paper and pencil analysis. No computers, no handheld calculators. Uh, they used strictly mathematical theory. It was mostly analysis of patterns based on the intercepted messages themselves. A tremendous intellectual feat. With JN25 broken, American cryptologists applied their intellect to deadly effect. Armed with decoded JN25 intercepts, Admiral Chester A. Nimitz held a critical edge in the war against Japan. In May 1942, when intercepts revealed the Japanese planned to lure America's aircraft carriers into a trap near the island of Midway, Nimitz plotted a trap of his own. Dispatching his carriers ahead of the Japanese timetable and avoiding their screening forces, Nimitz took Japan's strike force by surprise. For the Japanese Navy, this was its first defeat in over 300 years. Later, U.S. codebreakers scored another devastating blow against Japan. On April 13, 1943, three Navy listening posts simultaneously intercepted a JN-25 message. It was a transmission detailing the travel plans of Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese Combined Fleet. Yamamoto, architect of the raid on Pearl Harbor, was Japan's most valuable officer. The intercepted message sent by his staff revealed he was to begin a tour of Japan's forward bases in the Pacific. As a consequence of our knowledge of his itinerary, we were able to send up a flight of P-38 Lightnings and shoot him down. The mid-air assassination of Admiral Yamamoto was the most dramatic single episode ever to take place as a consequence of code breaking. It was in effect as if the United States had lost General Marshall, General Eisenhower, and General MacArthur all rolled into one. As Japan mourned its fallen leader, cryptologists focused their efforts once again against Germany. In the autumn of 1943, the United States and Britain were planning a risky cross-channel attack against Nazi-occupied France. But the Allies knew that the Germans had been fortifying the French coast for two years, expecting just such an invasion. In order for D-Day to succeed, Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower needed precise information on Germany's defenses and strategic intentions. To provide Eisenhower with the information he needed, codebreakers focused their attention on messages transmitted from a high-ranking diplomat in Berlin. But in an unusual backdoor route to gain information on Germany, the diplomat they targeted was Japanese. He was Japan's ambassador to the Third Reich, Oshima Hiroshi. Oshima Hiroshi was a remarkable uh, Japanese army officer and was very quick to make friends with top-ranking uh, German army officers, including Hitler. He was uh, immediately ushered in uh, to some of the, the very top-secret meetings uh, of the of the Germans, and being a, a good, uh, obedient ambassador, he reported everything that he learned about the Germans, from the Germans, back to Tokyo. 
The most crucial of Ashima's memos were radioed to Japan in November 1943. Decoded in Washington, they contained just the information Eisenhower needed for a D-Day attack. In them, Ashima described how the Germans had given him frontline tours of the French coastal defenses. In exacting detail, he described not only the Germans' defensive positions, but also what the Germans expected the Allies to do in their attempted invasion. Armed with the knowledge of a Third Reich insider, Eisenhower tailored his tactics accordingly and ordered the invasion to begin on June 6, 1944. Although the work of cryptologists helped the Allies on D-Day, the price of victory was high. Still, military experts assert that over the course of the war, communications intelligence spared the lives of tens of thousands of Allied fighters. After final victory had been achieved in 1945, Eisenhower personally thanked the Army Codebreakers at their headquarters at Arlington Hall in Washington. Convinced of the enormous value of their specialized branch of intelligence, American policymakers began efforts to form one unified agency to oversee it. After seven years of bureaucratic fits and starts, President Truman signed the National Security Agency into effect on October 24, 1952. By this time, the United States had entered into a new war, a cold one. And the NSA would play a major role in winning it. In a sub-basement at National Security Agency headquarters is one of the agency's most secret facilities. It's a high-tech factory producing computer chips for top-secret code-making devices. The laboratory lies beyond a gauntlet of security checkpoints. The last is a retina scan. But top secret clearance alone is not sufficient to gain full entry. All technicians must also be positively dust free. The reason the microchips produced in the lab are so sensitive they demand a totally sterile environment. An air shower removes whatever trace elements of dust remain. Here, microscopic precision is mandatory. In order to facilitate this, the lab is built on a base of 50 tons of concrete. Earth vibrations are negligible. The NSA is unwilling to disclose any details about the chips produced here but it acknowledges they're integrated into secret enciphering hardware, hardware designed to keep the government's communications safe from foreign code breakers. For 40 years, the motivating force behind the NSA's high-tech activities was the Cold War, but the agency's first breakthrough in that epic struggle was a triumph not of its machines, but its brain power. In the early 40s, before the Cold War had even begun, American listening posts were intercepting Soviet radio traffic, but the messages were indecipherable, protected by an ingenious double encryption system, in essence, a code within a code. The first layer of encryption was a code book, which uh, allows a, a code clerk to take text and substitute numerical entries. Uh, much in the way you'd look up entries in a dictionary. You'd look up a word and it would have an equivalent number and you would use that then to construct the message. But 
On top of that, the numbers then were encrypted using what's called a one-time pad. And a one-time pad is a, uh, is a pad of totally random numbers generated only once, and therefore it can't be reconstructed. The Soviets' one-time pads provided an impenetrable extra layer of encipherment. For example, if the first word of the coded message corresponded to 3856 in the first layer of encryption, then this number would be added to the first set of numbers in the random one-time pad. Complicating the code further was the fact that normal addition was not used, but the so-called Chinese arithmetic method, in which numbers greater than nine are not carried over. In 1944, as the indecipherable messages mounted, one cryptologist made a pivotal breakthrough. Cecil Phillips, an army codebreaker, detected a crucial error by the Russians. The Soviets were taking shortcuts, using the same one-time pads on multiple messages. This discovery was the first step in unraveling the code. When you work on a cipher problem, there are lots of times when you will make some discovery or break, and when that happens, you, it's, it's like Eureka, you've, you think you've found it, and uh, there's a kind of euphoria that goes with that that you, you couldn't duplicate any other way. Within two years of Philip's breakthrough, both layers of encipherment were painstakingly picked apart. The decrypted messages, codenamed Venona, stunned America's intelligence officials. A vast Soviet spy ring was operating in the United States. The level of the agent's penetration was alarmingly deep. This 1944 message makes reference to an unidentified operative in the inner circle of the wife of Kapitan, the Russian codename for Franklin Roosevelt. In other words, the Soviets had a spy within the entourage of the First Lady. Even more devastating was the revelation that the Soviets had penetrated the Manhattan Project, America's secret wartime effort to build the atomic bomb. The bomb, codenamed Anormos by the Russians, was the prime focus of the espionage ring. According to the Venona decrypts, the most active agent gathering such intelligence was codenamed Antenna, later designated Liberal. But his actual identity was unknown until 1949. Federal investigators discovered that Liberal was Julius Rosenberg, the owner of a small electrical engineering firm. On July 17, 1950, Rosenberg was taken into custody. On August 11th, Rosenberg's wife, Ethel, was also arrested. However, the Venona decrypts provided little information of her activities beyond her awareness of her husband's work for the Soviets. Convicted of treason in a trial that inflamed the nation, the Rosenbergs were sentenced to death in March of 1951. All told, more than 60 people implicated in the Venona decrypts were brought to justice or had their spy work neutralized. Another 140 remain unidentified to this day. As the Cold War extended to the 1960s, the NSA continued to secretly shape its course. The arena for one of its most crucial missions would be Fidel Castro's Cuba, which had emerged as a flashpoint of conflict between the two superpowers. The story of the Cuban Missile Crisis has been well documented, but the role of the NSA has been veiled until now. According to conventional accounts, the crisis began in 1962. On October 14th, photographs taken by U-2 spy planes revealed an alarming surprise. 
the Soviet Union was arming Cuba with ballistic missiles. Missiles which would put the eastern United States within range of a swift and disastrous nuclear attack. Historians have chronicled that this was the first evidence of the Soviet threat presented to President Kennedy by American intelligence. But in reality, NSA listening posts had been monitoring Cuba's arms buildup as early as 1960. The communications it intercepted concerned suspicious Soviet ships heading for Havana. For two years, NSA eavesdroppers heard Cubans discuss shipping procedures which spelled trouble. When the ships arrived, they were to be unloaded only at night. Deliveries were to roll away from the pier under black canvas and heavy guard, out of sight of onlookers. But it wasn't until September 15, 1962, that the NSA intercepted the most telling signal of all, an electronic fingerprint indicating the operational status of an SA-2 surface-to-air missile. Such a weapon was the Soviets' unique support for a nuclear missile facility. A month before the U-2s confirmed it, the NSA had collected strong evidence indicating Cuba's nuclear threat. So when the crisis erupted full-blown in October, President Kennedy was well prepared. With the world on the brink of nuclear war, the naval blockade he ordered was able to prevent the arrival of more missiles. Later, the Soviet Union agreed to remove the missiles already in place. The crisis predicted by the NSA was over. From the early skirmishes of the Cold War to the present day, Employees of the NSA have served in silent obscurity. Because much of cryptology is a cerebral endeavor, many perceive it as spycraft without risk. But the NSA has often had to place its people in harm's way. With a total of 152 fatalities to date, it's suffered more casualties than any other American intelligence service. The inherent danger of signals intelligence is that not all secret communications can be collected remotely. Net control, this is critical source. Uh, I read you. Uh, I, can you identify the tanks? Over. Listening posts must often be positioned perilously close to the target. In these cases, roles can be reversed, and the cryptologist himself becomes the target. This would be the fate of 11 Air Force cryptologists in 1958. Throughout the Cold War 50s, modified cargo planes were used for NSA missions targeting the Soviet Union. The planes would fly dangerously close to the Soviet border, attempting to draw a reaction from Russian air defenses for later analysis. On the maiden flight of one such aircraft, the Soviet response turned deadly. NSA ground eavesdroppers listened helplessly to the chatter of Russian fighter pilots as the crew of the C-130 realized the Soviet planes were closing in. When the Soviet aircraft decided to attack, it must have been panic aboard that aircraft. It's hard to imagine the fear that would be generated by that because they knew they were sitting ducks. A C-130 is a transport aircraft. It can't get out of the way. It can't fly as fast as a MiG-19. And there was nothing down below but mountains. They knew they were dead. What was left of RC-130 came down in Soviet Armenia. The entire crew of 17, including the 11 cryptologists, became unsung heroes of the Cold War. Three years later, a 25-year-old intelligence specialist from Tennessee would become the first casualty of another war. 
James T. Davis was the Army's first cryptologist in Vietnam and the first American to fall there. In 1961, Davis arrived in Vietnam, three years in advance of America's full military commitment. His assignment was to locate elusive communist guerrillas by homing in on their radio transmissions. The danger was that his direction-finding equipment would function effectively only if he were perilously near the enemy. Davis was in constant danger when he was in Vietnam because the direction-finding equipment that he had had to operate within about six miles of the Viet Cong transmitter. And if you're within six miles of the Viet Cong transmitter, you could be within a few hundred yards of the main force. For six months, Davis was assigned to small roving patrols south of Saigon. On December 22, 1961, the Viet Cong guerrillas he targeted were waiting in ambush. Davis and nine South Vietnamese soldiers were cut down in a hail of gunfire. A sole survivor escaped to report the massacre. Davis was the first of 59 cryptologists killed during the war. The specter of Vietnam is etched into the NSA's memorial, but the most deadly single incident in the history of cryptology occurred in another war a world away. On June the 5th, 1967, the Middle East erupted into what became known as the Six-Day War. Ordered to within earshot of the battle zone was the USS Liberty, a signals intelligence collection ship. On June the 8th, the Liberty was patrolling 22 kilometers off the Sinai coast, though in international waters, its close proximity to the Arab-Israeli conflict made it a vulnerable target. At two o'clock that afternoon, Israeli planes mounted an attack. As the Liberty was engulfed by fire, Israeli torpedo boats joined the attack. Incredibly, the pummeled Liberty did not sink, but 34 died and 170 were wounded. The next day, as the crippled vessel limped towards Malta, Israel offered apologies. Its military leaders claimed it had mistaken the American vessel for an Egyptian transport, the El Khazir. When I heard about it, I was sad, and I was not the only one. There was no cause, there was a mistake, and it's a pity that, uh, you know, good people are being killed uh, by a mistake. Some historical analysis has suggested otherwise. It's been pointed out that on the day of the attack, Israel had almost completed its overwhelming victory over its Arab enemies. But Israel's primary objective, the Golan Heights, was still held by the Syrians. By attacking the Liberty, the Israelis may have been trying to prevent America from learning the full extent of its gains. Concealing this information would have been crucial in staving off American intervention to stop the war before the Golan could be won. Whatever the truth, the fate of the Liberty is poignant evidence of cryptology's inherent peril. I think the Liberty incident reminds us of something that we never should forget. We make cryptanalysis sound like a clean, safe, academic way to get intelligence, but we need to realize that sometimes people in this business must risk or even give their lives for their country 
uh, in many ways, they are the quietest of the silent heroes of the Cold War. In the 21st century, the NSA now faces a new breed of challenges. In its biometrics lab, new technologies are being developed to protect America's secrets. Facial recognition systems provide added security to sensitive information in computer networks, soon to be obsolete of vulnerable passwords. Passwords can be guessed about 30% of the time. So what we would like to do is depend upon some intrinsic characteristic of the individual rather than on something that they have to remember. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. And in the case of face recognition, there's nothing to touch. You, you really have to do nothing more than just be yourself. Biometrics research reflects the NSA's escalating emphasis on the need for defense in the information age. Technicians are devising innovative methods to protect America from the threat of cyber warfare. Military experts warn that a terrorist armed only with a modem and a mouse could trigger catastrophe. Preventing such an attack is among the NSA's new challenges. The National Security Agency's central responsibility is to preclude strategic surprise. So as we look at conflict in the information age, it's terribly important that NSA succeed in avoiding an electronic Pearl Harbor. In an electronic Pearl Harbor, the electron is the ultimate guided weapon. The nightmare scenario would begin with a salvo of stealth software, known as logic bombs, followed by a variety of ingenious viruses. The principal target would be the network of computers controlling the nation's economy. Millions could wake up to discover their bank accounts emptied. Investors could lose fortunes instantly, sparking panic, which would crumble America's financial bedrock. Also targeted would be the nation's transportation systems. Virulent software worms would invade the computers operating air traffic control. False messages could order planes to land on crowded runways. America's skies would be in turmoil, a death trap. With its transportation grid locked, its communications disrupted, and its economy ruined, America could be plunged into anarchy. Though some experts maintain a disaster of this magnitude is unlikely, most agree that cyber warfare will be the new battleground of the 21st century. To repel any future attack, the NSA is developing defensive measures which are closely guarded secrets. For half a century, unmatched secrecy has been fundamental to the NSA's success. Okay, morning everybody. Start us off duty. Good morning, sir. Right after Those who work here maintain that an exceptional level of commitment is also imperative. For some at the NSA, this commitment was best illustrated when they eavesdropped on signals during a foreign skyjacking in the 1980s, a crisis in which lives hung in the balance. Although the NSA will not comment on the specifics of the incident, what they feel should be known is the uncommon conduct of their colleagues. You could see the tension because they were almost willing communications to happen so that they could provide intelligence that might make a difference. The good news was that it ended and most people were rescued. The tragedy of that was that one individual was killed. They were devastated when that person was killed. When it was all over, 
They sent flowers, and they attended the funeral. Nobody knew they were there. Nobody knew where the flowers came from. Those are the kinds of people we have working in this building. They never talk about the events they support. They never talk about the tragedies that go on, but they really identify with whatever is going on in the world. And they really identify with the fact that they may be thousands of miles away, but through electronic communications, they are there as part of the fight. To fight its secret war, the NSA wraps the globe in its electronic embrace. It will continue to listen for trouble like a doctor with a stethoscope pressed to the world. A rare bacterial disease causes concern when it claims a life. Diagnosis Unknown takes up the story next on Discovery. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you.